Hey, hey, my fantastic viewers. It's your buddy Kronos, back with another adrenaline-pumping episode of What If? Are you ready to continue our mind-bending journey into the world of video game powers and heroic quests? Because today, we're diving headfirst into part 3 of What If Deku Has Video Game Powers? Can you feel the excitement? It's about to get even more electrifying as we uncover new challenges, unlock hidden abilities, and witness Deku's evolution into the ultimate pixelated hero. So grab your virtual gear, level up your enthusiasm, and let's embark on the next thrilling chapter of this epic series. Chapter 4 of the Eye A week ago, Yagi Tashinori gripped the coat that covered his fragile body. The cold of the city night was biting hard, and the wound on his left side reminded him that cold nights as this did nothing good to it. It just made it ache like nothing he could ever imagine. Yet he shouldered on. It wasn't the first time he felt his wound giving him trouble due to the weather. But it had been a while, usually staying in the apartment of the city he is currently staying, looking for that one, the one to inherit one for all, to become the next symbol of peace, to carry a legacy of justice few can only imagine. He hadn't exactly found that one. He had traveled all over the world to be perfectly honest looking for that one, and so far he had been unsuccessful. His return to Mizurifu, the place where it all began was only known to Sir Night Ai, who immediately phoned him. Yagi at first believed he was going to get an earful, and he got one, one that surprisingly lasted a minute, then Sir went to the matter at hand. They needed someone, that someone being him to infiltrate the Colosseum, an underground fighting pit where the youth of the city, the troubled youth that is, fights, not each other, but actual bows of various designs. They needed Yagi Tashinori, not All Might, to infiltrate it, keep an eye, and constantly update them for the eventual raid they will carry to the place. All Might is too noticeable, Yagi Tashinori is not, he would blend with the crowd, Sir Knight I had told him in a call three days ago. And he had done that, he had went the moment he was able, which was right after he rented a small apartment, and started his mission, he was told to just carry his cell phone, nothing more, no monitoring devices on him. The Colosseum security was tight. He learned how tight it was the first day. Entering had been easy. It was like entering a stadium and buying tickets. They actually sold tickets to enter, despite the fact the place was located in the ruins of Musidifa's old metro lines. Inside he had seen that most attendants were teens, troubled teens. Teens who were one bad day from becoming villains. There he had seen a lot of things, from the defense lines, which varied from very thick metal doors he could knock out with a punch, from gun turrets, actual turrets, and two tall boxes that seemed to contain something within. It was something humanoid, he assumed, and he assumed well when he saw what the teens were willing to fight against. These bows, they were truly works of horror, and actually dangerous each one capable of untold damage if not fought properly. He did notice the amount of gangs in the Colosseum, to the point he felt sick to the stomach, every kid there, wanting to earn easy money, easy fame, easy everything. Many assume that going hero is the easy road, they assume wrong, it is a hard road, one that can kill you if you aren't careful. The first night had been, rough, the exit of the Colosseum had been, screened of all things, they had scanners of all sorts, scanning his body for anything that wasn't a cell phone, and if the cell phone was actually bugged. That day he understood how heavy their security was, one can enter easily, exiting was the hard part. The first report had been a pain, not because he was bad at paperwork or reporting, but because he didn't know how, he didn't know there was a protocol for these things, so his first report was rather informal, they forgave him about it especially since he was adding more to what they already had. Now, three days later, he was back in the Colosseum, sitting on his lonesome, looking at the kids fight, willing himself not to jump and intervene, and probably ruin everything. The bows still perturbed him, especially when he learned that those things were in fact video game monsters, someone had taken something out of fiction and made it real, and functional. He doesn't want to know how you make a monster like the liquor functional, the brain it's outside the skull and it has no skin, or eyes. What kind of creature works in such a way? It should be in pain and begging for death, 
not trying to claw a kid's face off and impale so said kid with a tongue that shoots like a spear, and it's long as one. During his scouting he spotted several kids, Night Eye had pictures of them, mugshots, they had rap sheets, one of them was responsible of nearly crippling a student of Aldera, a student that was expelled after protecting a fellow student from being raped by shouting someone so hard that present Mike would be proud, and slightly miffed. He also saw adults, adult leading these kids, leading them astray, showing them vices and, Jaggy bit the urge to buff out and beat everyone in the Coliseum. Realistically he could, he hasn't transformed in the past three days, he had stayed in his skinny form. According to Night High, it would be a huge surprise to suddenly see All Might on the scene when there was no mention of him ever arriving, and he agreed, but the weight was killing him, metaphorically of course. Yet he had to remain calm and focused, he would have plenty of time to vent once the order is given, oh then he will let loose some steam. For now he would observe and learn, these creatures would certainly would be used in the defense, he wanted to be ready for anything they might throw at them, thrown at him. He knew that he was stronger than anything these things could ever hope to be. The nemesis as Night Eye had called them, could pose a problem, they seemed strong. Agile and also intelligent, scarily so, but they would fold, even if he had to punch them to stains to the ground. He might hold a little against the average criminal, but that that was because the average human would not be able to handle a punch like his. A bow however, a creature as disgusting as this, or they would taste his full power. He might be weak, but he is still the strongest, and definitely stronger than a nemesis. Six days ago. Mirio gazed at the book Izuku had handed Sir Night Eye several days ago, while one of the books, the other was being used for the case, the one detailing the story of Aldera, the very lurid story at that. Honestly Mirio had found himself disgusted at the very contents. He knew the story of Aldera High was a torrid mess that made sewage water look pristine in comparison, but this put in contrast. But the book he was looking now, the Book of Villains as it was dubbed, made him realize something, something deep. He had been slacking in a particular area, one area that Izuku had honed to the point of becoming his very own sword. While both Mirio and Izuku were very able to realize what quirk is being used against them, Mirio depends more on his speed and quirk to quickly overwhelm his opponents with brutal blows to the gut and liver. But that puts him too close for a villain to counter if that doesn't work, or he doesn't realize what quirk the villain has. What it can do and how it activates. Izuku on the other hand, he didn't need to be trained in that art, because he was already a master of it. He put it in the book itself, a villain way of dressing and equipment can tell you how their quirk works. Less clothes in a villain means two things, one that their quirk requires skin exposure, so it can be an emitter-type quirk, also it means it is highly destructive and can be a collateral nightmare. More clothes means that the quirk affects the person in question, and needs to regulate it, lest he or she falls victim of his or her own power. Specialized equipment means specialized weaknesses, weaknesses that can be exploited, even their own behavior can be used against them. They become dependent of their equipment and telegraph their attacks. Specialized clothes, ones with themes were sure marks to distinguish what kind of quirk they possess and how to counter it. It was an eye-opener, this they didn't teach in UA or any other academy, maybe because it was something you had to learn in your three years, or maybe because heroes tended to be far better trained than the villains, who despite having powerful quirks tended to be overwhelmed by teamwork and a fist force trauma to the face. That was one of the many edges heroes had against villains. One that seemingly the troop had been trying to undermine. They had worked the long con, and the purpose was clear as day. Fifty years ago, when the troop first made their debut, by having the British Parliament butchered by one of their bows, they had been no more than a myth in the underworld. When the massacre occurred, they sent a manifesto all over the world, in it they stated that the world was a petri dish and they were the scientists in this grand experiment, and they would experiment to their heart's content. No morals. No one would stop them. That was the basic gist of it, of what Mirio knows. The manifesto was over a hundred pages long, denouncing everyone, heroes, villains, governments, other scientists, 
Blaming the for the state of the world, the stagnation, the troops swore that they would drag the world out of this needless era, kill all false idols, burn all governance. Create a new world order, one where logic and science rules over, and they would do so on the blood of their enemies and children. Suffice to say that they became the first terrorist organization in the current Quirk era. Most, if not all terrorist organizations of the pre-Quirk era suffered, casualties at the hands of their now empowered victims, all while they struggled to defend themselves against the tide that was long time coming. The troop had become one of the main targets of Interpol, who had pretty much become an international hero slash cop force, pulling from every corner of the planet to hit any criminal organization that might become a problem. The fact that the Shai Saikai had passed their radar was disconcerting, that or someone was messing up and feeding them up false info, this were the guys that helped manufacture the Asian and oral version of Trigger. How could they when they were working on scraps and savings was beyond him. But they did it, in five years no less. Closing the book, Mirio stood up from the desk he was using. He began to roll his neck and shoulders. Sir had drilled him to stretch after staying in the same position for a while. Prevents pain and cramps. And keeps him prepared for anything that might come. With his impromptu stretch done, Mirio made his way to Sir Naitai's office, knowing once, he entered once he heard Sir's voice giving him the okay. Once inside, the had to blink in surprise when he saw none other than All Might, sitting in one of the chairs, a chair that looked comical for a man of his size. Mirio Kuen, welcome, I hope you read Mr. X's book. Mirio nodded, actually noting how Sir Naitai used Azuka's new nickname at least the nickname he gave to the others regarding who gave them the two books and actually identified the bows pictured in the Colosseum. It had been something that night I had to made on the spot when that cop had actually, somehow, entered the conference room where he, Ryukyu, Fat Gum and Naomesa were discussing and had tried to worm himself into the investigation, asking who had provided the books. Night I, on panic, had decided to nickname Izuku as Mr. X, after one of the creatures featured in the pictures, according to Izuku, the nemesis and the Mr. X in the pictures were collectively known as tyrants, since those particular tyrants, unlike the nemesis, were made to infiltrate and actually look human-like. Human enough to pass unaware in a crowd and not spare a second glance, if you ignore the fact they are over seven feet tall. Nicknaming Izuku Mr. X was also to protect him as well, this guy, Durara Honda, the cop that had screwed an operation so vital against human traffickers that a cop was willing to kill him and several pro-heroes were willing to look the other way because of his fuck-up over 50 kids were lost to them, and no one was captured. It was a disaster the media attacked heroes for months, the police lost a lot of faith of the public by that alone, the only reason Honda wasn't fired was because his dad is the mayor of the city, and had actually threatened both the heroes stationed in the city and the police force. Durara was still in the force. But no one wanted to work with him and ensured to keep him away of anything that he might fuck again, like this. After that it became the norm to call him Mr. X, a security measure that night I had hoped they wouldn't use, hell he had planned to keep Izuku away of the investigation altogether, only calling him when testimony of his days in Aldera, the staff treatment of him would be the final nail in the coffin of Aldera High Staff and perhaps finally replace them with more competent members. Alas, it wasn't meant to be, and had to put him under the alias Mr. X and as an informant. Yes, Sir Knight, I, I have, it is rather perturbing, Mirio confessed, taking a seat near All Might. I know, but it is not the reason you are here now. We are here to talk about your participation in the raid we are planning, and your role in it. Five days ago. Boom. Kaichisaki, or as he liked to be called, Overhaul, was glad for the mask on his face, for it covered his nose from the smoke, soot and the horrible smell of burned flesh, carbonized bones and what he assumed were the chemicals used for the bombs. Yes, bombs, bombs that somehow were placed, inside his base, under his nose, and the nose of his underlings, bombs that were placed on the cells where he kept Airy, an Airy that was now fucking gone. I'm going to kill someone. Overhaul blinked, looked to his right side, and spotted at one of his underlings. They called him Warden, for he was that, a warden. After Ares' last escape, 
one of his underlings, one that was tired of her constant escape attempts and that caused collateral damage as a result, approached him, when he was at his worst, and laid to him a very complex contention plan for Aerie, keeping her as a prisoner. It had been quite a successful plan, if Overhaul was being honest. The three last attempts of Ari to escape had ended even before she left the hall. Then this happened. The plan was surprisingly simple and yet complicated. Ari was constantly being moved to the labs at least twice a week, so every day, when she was required to do her necessities, while she was in the bathroom, the room-slash-cell was thoroughly searched, all while she was moved to another room-slash-cell. This ensured that every day they would keep staking the room she was before, looking for any artifacts she may have stowed to escape again, all the while it prevented to formulate an effective escape plan. Simple but at the same time difficult, as it required that five guys to search the cell for any kind of object she might use in her escape. Her sessions in the labs lasted two hours. They had that exact amount of time to ensure the cell slash room was searched and ensure that when she eventually ends up in that room again after the rotation. She can't find whatever items she may have stowed. This could only be done with a single prisoner. Multiple would be a logistical nightmare. I'm going to wrap my hands in the intestines of whoever did this and make him eat them. The warden screamed, screamed like an animal. He was mad, and honestly Overhaul was too. But right now he let the man rage and rage for him by proxy. Because honestly this was bullshit, and if he raged he would end up killing people and they need the manpower. And also save energy for the one who fucked up this. It was half an hour later that the warden stood in front of him, in his office, looking miffed as hell, but more calm than he was before, which was saying something. Overhaul was also prone to violent outbursts when things didn't come his way, but warden took it to a new level. The man stood over six feet tall, but wasn't too muscular, in fact he was quite lanky compared to other members of the same height, brown eyes and brown hair he looked rather, simple in his frank opinion, vanilla looking, if you were to ignore his quirk that is, sniff, which allowed him to sniff out anything and identify it with pinpoint point accuracy, something had to be really mixed up or messed up for him to not identify it via sniff. Warden, what happened? Overhaul asked. As usual Chronostasis stood at his side, his ever-loyal assistant, and of course Mimic, making counts of the damage and how much they would have to pay to repair the damage and clean up. We, I, got blindsided, Warden confessed, visibly angry. The cells, all five of them were infiltrated, someone drilled holes on the wall, or better said melted holes in the wall, my best guess, they were after Aerie. Warden confessed, their overhaul took a deep breath narrowing his eyes. No one but us know about Eri, not even the heroes, no one else, how someone knew about her and where to hit, and at that point what we were hit with. Overhaul asked, now wondering who was the rat, and how it was going to die. Bomb sir, Warden stated, looking rather irritated. I used my quirk on the remains of the bombs, all I know is that they started with white phosphorus, and ended with something akin to nuclear waste. Warden stated, making overhaul blink, even more when Warden placed what seemed to be a melted, blackened and wrapped piece of metal on the desk. This is all I could find of the bombs. All four caused massive damage. This last one didn't detonate it properly, so I found it in a pristine state. He added with clenched teeth. Overhaul blinked. So did chronostasis and mimic. Warden's quirk would and should had allowed him to determine the ingredients of the bombs. The fact he could identify two, and the last one is a big if meant that whoever did this was a professional. My best guess, they waited until Ari was in one of the cells, melted the holes in the walls, at the same time, looking for her. Once found they took her from us and placed the bombs to cover their escape. Warden stated. Any leads, did you found the exit holes and where they lead? Overhaul asked. I did sir which leads me to believe we are dealing with a very dangerous organization. They had military-grade materials. If the white phosphorus is of any indication, tactically it was a smooth operation. What I cannot, for the life of me, figure is how they escaped. The tunnel leads to nowhere. Warden stated, their overhaul heard Mimic huff. Use your mind, 
They surely had someone with a warp quirk or a teleportation quirk waiting for them in a master tunnel, Mimic sneered. The tunnels were not connected. Each one of them was individually made. They all present the same chemical pattern in the walls. The same chemical used to melt the walls was used to melt tunnels, individual tunnels. This leads me to believe this was made by a military-like organization. This level of coordination is above any other villain gang in the city. Warden stated, clearly angry at all this. Indeed, yet the question remains, who was it? Chronostasis wondered. Mimic just kept working on the accounts, trying to find a way to handle the money without going into the red. I could only think of two organizations with the manpower, coordination and the recourses to go against us with what Overhaul Sama has made, Warden stated. One is the Meta Liberation Army. They have the deepest pockets, and unlike most of us, keep their identities a secret. It has worked wonders on them, until Dash. Until there was a disagreement, Overhaul stated, looking at Warden dead in the eyes. Yes, sir, a rogue faction of the MLA. They made their name during the galley incident. No one wanted to add that the galley incident saw the Prime Minister's wife dead, their son in a wheelchair and their son's wife losing their unborn child, and that the Prime Minister wanted blood and scalps, and he wanted them both in bulk. One could really not blame the man for abdicating rougher sentences to villains and mass murderers, and to completely annihilate organizations like theirs. The other is the troop. Warden heard Mimic actually mutter a motherfucker as he stopped doing accounting. Are you certain? Overhaul asked dangerously, and he had his reasons. The troop didn't allied with no one. They used organizations and people like using toilet paper, then they dispose of it. So he is not to blame when considering that one of the most dangerous terrorist organizations, with their own biological weapons, could have airy. It fits them. It fits, sir. If somehow they know about the key component of the bullets, then it would stand to reason they would risk war with us. I mean they can throw as many soldiers as they want to us. We don't have that luxury. Warden stated the grim truth of their state to their leader who was well aware of this fact. Any way to find her? Overhaul asked, seeing Warden shake his head. Not without tipping our motives, we are underhanded now. Those three guys that died in the explosions are the guys I specifically set to hunt Ari if she ever somehow escaped. They could track her within minutes, but with them dead, he let that hung in the air. Overhaul was honestly seething right now. This all smelled to a rat. The death of the only people that could hunt Ari, where to find her, her role in all this, it bothered him greatly. But I could go to the Colosseum. The kids there are dumb. They talk a lot. Someone would babble about having a horned girl with white hair and red eyes in their custody, as something to impress the boss and something. Warden supplied. No, you won't go. I need you here to tighten the security. I want you to find the rat and bring him or her to me. I'll deal with the rest. Warden nodded. Chronostasis, I want you to go to the Colosseum. See if you can find information. So said man nodded, but had his own doubts. Doubts he didn't need to voice because his boss could see them as clear as day in his face. Yes, I know, I could send Rappa for this. But right now we don't need bash skulls, that comes later. Right now we need a velvet glove, you are that glove, Rappa is the mace. And when we have the info, he will break skulls. Overhaul promised. No one steals from us. Four days ago. Eri had thought that she was saved, that she was going to be okay, but it hasn't been that way. The day she had been freed she had been honestly happy, she was out of Overhaul's hands. Then she got handed to someone worse, which she thought was impossible. They took blood, they took skin, they took hair, they took her tears, they touched her in ways that made her feel ill. They were worse than Overhaul, but they were sloppy, first-timers on keeping a prisoner. The moment one of them looked away, Ari was gone, running away as if the very devil was behind her, whispering to her run little girl run, or I'll get you so she ran, ran, ran and ran on this strange base that she didn't know until she came across something she was familiar with. A truck, a truck filled with junk. It was a perfect escape option, these guys didn't know where she was now, or what she was capable of. With a small sigh of relief she went to the truck and found what she wanted, a sofa, 
an upturned sofa with a broken bottom. Also there was a lot of junk and metal sheets she could use to cover the hole. So she did that. Her hands were small. She was weakened by the blood extraction and the scraping of skin. She was dizzy and hungry. But she somehow got the job done. She hid on the broken sofa and put the sheets over it. And then she waited. She felt the first movement, and then elation as the truck filled with junk began to move. She was tense. Also she was hungry. So time simply felt like crawling to her. She didn't know how to measure time. So to her a single day can drag to a week. Or sometimes it can fly as fast as a wink. This time it felt like forever. Eventually the truck stopped, and she felt movement. Then she felt the sofa, and by extension everything move, then the world moved around her. Her body was weakened already, but she was used to the pain, a sad thing, so she didn't scream or whimper in pain as her body hit the insides of the sofa. Then all it stopped, she didn't move, not until she heard the truck's noise move away, but once she didn't hear the noise, she began to leave her hiding position. The first thing she saw was the ocean. It was not a familiar sight, she had seen it at least twice in her life. She wished she could cross it putting as much distance as she could have overhaul and these new monsters. Looking around she saw she was on a beach, a beach filled with metal and rust and sofas and everything. Thankfully there wasn't anything squeaky in the beach, just metal. She didn't know where she was now, which was a good thing, either did overhaul. Looking at the horizon, she saw dark clouds forming in the sky. Not good, they usually mean rain, cold, with what she has on, she cold will force her to overhaul once more. It did in more than one occasion. She needed shelter. She needed food. So Ari left the beach for her search of food and a roof. She found a nightmare hours later. Three days ago. Inko frowned, not because the weatherman had pretty much predicted a week worth of light rain, cold and winds, not because she now had to break her coats and umbrella out. This was pretty much a necessity in Japan especially with the weather as it is. Even after 200 years of trying to fix the fuck-ups of nations and governments that thought it would be a good idea to pass over Mother Nature, only to be reminded by so said Mother Nature that she is not to be fucked with, as North America learned the hard way with 10 class 5 hurricanes popping out of the freaking air in a month. During the first year a quirk first ever manifested. No, the reason of her frowning was because her son, had once again, gone and done it, he had added something else to his ever-growing list of powers, and he promised her that he would try to tone it down. She was kinda miffed, not enough to yell or be mad, but disappointed that her son had done this when he said he wouldn't. But then came Clarity, what else was he supposed to do? He was pretty much confined to the house due to his injury. The weather was bad enough that walking with a crutch would guarantee a fall to the ground not to mention that the cold was actually making him ache. She had seen him rub the cast of his leg several times over and make a face whenever he thought she wasn't watching. And apparently he had a reasoning behind this one, timing. According to his son, he had this game basically completed, but he thinks his quirk might be a little arbitral with its activation method since this game had no visible difficulty modifier, at least to make the overall game harder. Unless you want to play blindfolded, his quirks seemed to demand him the 100 completion. As a result he had to tackle the last obstacle he had in game. He called it the Shattered Throne, and he had to do it solo, and with the armor that belonged to that particular spot, while, whatever Ascendant is, and without dying. He did it in an hour, so he took his sweet time because of the last challenge, not dying, the end result? He burned the controller, and part of the carpet, and freaked her the hell out. To be fair, when your son comes out of the room, enveloped in flames that seem to not burn him, but give the impression that they do, you would too. Then came the scolding, and his defense as well, she did saw this coming, he had nothing to do but study and play video games, and actually lift the weights she had in her room, a memento of times past, that was literally all he could do right now. He could not train with all he had due to his leg, the doctors had been clear with that. The skin grafts would take time to become part of Izuka's own skin, the muscles, while rebuild, would take time as well. The bones were the actual issue, with 14 fractures, 
the operation to put them all in place, while successful was also delicate. And so the recovery time, all fourteen fractures had to mend, he couldn't, realistically support his weight on his right leg due to this, he had to keep it from touching the ground, to support weight, reason he had to remain either seated of laying down, or if he moved, use the crutch. Honestly she should had seen this coming, he did had said that this had to happen, he had to complete it now or he would have to wait three more weeks, due to the rotation of the curse as it was known again, he had already put it past for two days due to the amount of homework he had, which he completed. She also knew what he was doing when he wasn't actually on bed or seated, playing and writing. She had seen him play other games, playing actually slowly, taking his time, and when he wasn't doing that, he was on his notebook, working on whatever there it lay, she trusted him, she knew that this all stemmed from the fact he had ten years of catch-up to do, his quirk potential was great, perhaps greater than anyone's. To actually cherry-pick power, she knew half of the world would wish for something like Izuka's power. With a sigh, Inko focused again on her son, that now was floating away what? Inko blinked once, then again, looked down, and saw that her son was in fact floating off the ground, with electricity coming out of his feet, the possible reason he was defying gravity, that and the fact he was now covered in lighting, small bolts of lightning dancing around him as a bluish aura covered him. Izuku Inko began. I am the storm now mom, I ascended to a higher plane. Then he began to float into his room, slowly, yet she noted the small smile tugging at his lips. You are not the storm your fourteen stop floating. I can't I am the eye of the storm, I am the calm and the rage, I am enlightened. Now she was sure he was smiling. I will enlighten your rump to my hand stop floating. Sometimes she wondered if this what other mothers felt when their quirk children began to activate their quirks at random and spouting weird words, the frustration, the elation. And yes she is elated, doesn't mean she is not going to ground him, then again he melted his controller, that's punishment enough for not telling her what he was about to do. Two days ago. Did her blood worked? It did wonders, the tea dolls are stabilized. The skin? Again, wonders, we were able to clone it in great numbers, we send a box to America. Yet we are still away of our original goal. Not far enough, sir. Oh? About a week or so one of our aides in a hospital came across an interesting blood sample. It is highly adaptable. Remember that creature we took from that failure of a doctor? Yes, it reminds me of a liquor, but incomplete. Yes, it also had a quirk, or multiple. We tried to add them to our tea dolls, it didn't work. I know, why bring it up then? The blood sample our aide took from the hospital, it has incredibly adaptability, far above our experiments ever reached. We use one of our beta dolls, alongside the new samples and, it worked sir, it had power, power beyond our expectations, not even M98 matches what we made with this one, it had a quirk. I see, how successful are we talking about? Superior reflexes, strength and durability than expected, we added that creature's blood with some chemicals of our own and enhanced it even more. Of course we are not deploying something of this value, we are going to run more tests, then dismantle beta and use the parts for something better. And the source of the new blood sample? I hope you have a name. I do, even a dossier, Izuka Midoriya, highly unremarkable, clean sheet. He could be the new pope if he wanted, freaking saint he is, he was part of a control group, all but him had quirks, endured three years of bullying that sent someone like him in group gamma into suicide after six months, he endured three years straight of it. No thanks to our prospect, Katsuki Bakugu, real piece of work he is, we are aiming to break him to our needs. Hmm, what makes this boy special, you said he had no quirk. Yeah, we based our findings. As usual form medical records, it showed he didn't had one, but he is directly responsible of putting one of B's lackeys into a wall, with his voice alone. A quirk? Manifesting this late? Interesting. That's the tip of the iceberg, the kid's blood was all over his pants. Thanks to B's breaking his leg, we got a hefty sample, his DNA is a marvel. Our scientists call it adaptive, I call it what we need to speed up the process. 
but with the girl gone. How she escaped. Freaking ghost that girl is, you blink she's gone. We can thank Overhaul for that. Our source inside claims the girl has died over 25 times this year alone. Overhaul blows her up with his quirk. They grab all the blood and organs they can of the mess. Then he puts her back together. Explains why she attempted escapes at least twice a week, and completed one every two months. She perfected the art out of desperation. Hmm, make capture of the girl priority epsilon. Ascend it to alpha if we start running short of material and we need to study her quirk on a deeper level. As for the boy, hmm, you say a beta became superior to M98, right? Yes, sir. I dare say it could take ten nemesis with both arms tied and win. M98 can only take five, and in peak condition. Tell B to acquire him, and his family as well. Make her believe she needs to ensure social norms to be back in shape. Put them in the Colosseum. Have M98 there. Want to see if M98 can win against the source of Beta's augments? Yes, if Delta loses, we gain combat data. And if M98 wins, we gain a corpse for our scientists to poke at and clone to their merriment. Consider the message send. You know what? Let's make it even more interesting. Send the golems, send the undertakers, send the C6s. Allow be free reign on how to acquire the Midorias, but it has to be done in two days. You want to ascend her? She is young and brash. This will be a proof of how she will handle under pressure, succeed and she will share a position of comfort when he rid Japan of this. Filth they call government and heroes, fail and well. People like her are dime a dozen, we can always find someone else. Also, should I send a drone for the data gathering? You are sending our foot soldiers. Oh, but I expected you to do so. We have so little combat data acquired, and third world countries and obscure guerrillas are hardly worth sending a platoon of troopers, let alone a platoon of undertakers, even more so for combat data. They don't last long enough for it to be a successful experiment. Agreed, I'll send two drones then. Have them ready for anything, sir. Good. One day ago. Izuka held his hand upward. With a mental command he began to channel the light of the traveler he now wielded. To be more specific, he began to wield the arc light into his hands, letting it form into a stream of electricity that licked his skin. With a grin he began to give the arc energy in his hand a shape he had in mind. It was hard but it would prove fruitful in the end, as he was trying to learn how to control the output of so said energy when he finally uses it. He had been surprised when he had acquired the light, it had been a gamble to be honest. When he had first compiled his list he hadn't considered that he might need a ghost to get it. After all there was no registered case in game of anyone gaining the light without a ghost. But he had it now, and he had been surprised by what he had now, he wielded the light and as he had suspected some abilities the guardians had were not on him, like the self-regenerating health, or the light shield, he suspected both of them were a ghost thing, he did feel stronger, the basic warlock palm strike could kill a dreg with a hit. A basic titan punch can kill in one hit as well. He didn't have the grenades, as he suspected it was perhaps another ghost thing, but he wielded the light in its three spectrums, arc, solar and void and he somehow slipped into the storm trance within minutes of getting it, and melting his controller when he first wielded solar light. He had the supers, no doubt about it. The thing was that he didn't just had warlock supers, as he expected, his main was a warlock, but the supers of all three classes, all mashed together by the light they shared, how he found out about this. Well, he melted the controller with the hammer of soul. While he was still holding it, the fact he hammered didn't explode as they usually do made him realize he had certain control of when they do. This was a game changer. It made his quirk more complicated. He knew that he should have just the powers of one class, the warlock. But he had all three, versatility-wise. It would allow him to do a lot of things in one go. With the Well of Dawn he can become a mobile triage center. With the Ward of Dawn he can create a small safe haven for civilians. The Night Stalker bow would be perfect for detainment and containment of masses and criminals. As the bolts and tethers of the bow actually suppress, he doesn't know if they will actually suppress a quirk. But if they do, of that will make the bow an invaluable tool. Like Kate said, 
everyone loves night stalkers. But then came the hard part, control. Unlike guardians, he doesn't has the crucible, or Ikora, or Zavala, or Cade, or a legion of alien monsters to test himself, or someone to teach him how to control the light. From here on out, it was all him. He knew how to cast the super, and how to bring the three spectrums of light forth. But that made him dangerous, he needed first control. To that end he began to focus on a single element, and what better way to start that with arc energy. He somehow had slipped into and out of the storm trance with an ease that he figured Akora would find scary. He figured that since he had lived a chaotic life and had tried to weather it the best he could. His emotions were better attuned to enter the storm trance with ease, he means he is slipping in and out of it to actually levitate, not using the crutches, which was cool, he had slowly learned to tone down the trance, allowing himself to just levitate, and actually interact with other objects, also to use it longer. Still he carries a lot of electric current, so he had to be careful, no hugging mom and kissing her while in the storm trance. After he was certain that he had mastered the trance, he'll focus on the second part, Chaos Reach, a pure, concentrated beam of arc energy that can vaporize anything caught in its path. One would think that's a bad idea, but not him. Chaos Reach was one of the few supers that didn't require him to touch the ground. Also it would allow him to test how much energy he can expel and demand during the casting, for he had found something else. He seemed able to cast the supers with particular ease, almost no cooldown, he slipped in and out of the trance with particular ease, but in game you can't do that. Once you enter the storm trance, you have to use it completely, only chaos reach can be cancelled during use, the others not so much. Which led him to his final theory about his quirk, at least for the day, since his quirk allowed the use of powers that belonged to games, and therefore tied to codes and video game physics, now that were in the real world, they were not tied to that code, to that logic, supers were no longer tied to a bar and could be used until they were full. Like his shouts, they were in a word unbound. It scared him, this kind of power, he needed to learn to control it. With a sigh he summoned his spectral arms, all six arms suddenly going forth and cupping at the air, all while Izuka held his hand with arc light and let it dissipate. Then let it out into the spectral arms, each limb cracking with arc energy, then each first cracked against one another, a small thunderclap, localized on the room made Izuka slightly flinch, but it didn't bother him, it was a happy accident that allowed him to discover that particular features of his quirks. He could mix his powers with one another, he found out about this when he used his elemental fury shout, while he had his spectral arms out, just to see what would happen. He expected them to cancel one another, he didn't expect it to see the arms enveloped in small gush of wind, and actually, after throwing some jabs, so said jabs to be faster than they usually were. Dismissing the arms, he focused again in his hand, letting arc energy again flow to the palm of his hand. With a deep breath he began to form the shape of what he wanted in arc energy, a circle, an actual circle. It would be simple to just make a ball of pure arc energy, but he wasn't aiming for that. He was aiming for control, what better way to do that that to make a circle, an actual circle out of arc energy. He honestly didn't want to end up like the Kappa. Now there was a story that would make it to video games because of its absurdity. A man with the power to take quirks from others, a mastermind of the underworld that actually ruled Japan, even if there were public elected individuals on seats of power, the Kappa ruled Japan from the shadows with an iron fist. Of course heroes of that time knew of the man, many died trying to fight him up front, but his power didn't only stem from his many quirks, but from the empire that he controlled, so they decided to attack that instead, take the legs of his empire, dummy companies, drug manufacturers, laundry schemes, human trafficking. That one had earned him international notoriety. The Russians called him Baba Yaga, an entire platoon of soldiers with exceptional quirks had been lost. They were found a month later, lost, weakened, without their quirks near Hokkaido. South Africa had suffered an incredible loss of people thanks to him, who they called Tokalash, the amount of children that became quirkless thanks to him, even when South Africa became a superpower thanks to the emergence of quirks, was staggering. 
In Latin-speaking countries, they knew him as the El Hombre del Saco or the Sack Man, for very good reasons. Of all the countries that had a story about him, Latin America was hit the worst by him. In ten years dozens upon of dozens of children were lost, never to be seen again, kidnapped. Unlike the rest, they were never found. Many doubted it had been him, but rather human traffickers using his shadow to conduct their business. But the fact remained, unlike children taken by those men, they sometimes escaped. The ones taken by the sack man never did. They were just an example of the man, a man that disappeared into anonymity at least a hundred years ago. Many assumed that age had gotten him, escaped the authorities, but not the pass of time. But from time to time someone would surface, without a quirk when he had won before. And the shadow of the Kappa would appear once more on a country that got an ill reputation thanks to his exploits. Yes, Japan may be known as the current home of heroics, with some of the rarest quirks know, and some of the most powerful heroes in the world, but the shadow of the Kappa still shrouded them, still stunned them. He didn't want to then like the Kappa, hungry for power, realistically he knew that a hero should be powerful, and that he had zero chances to become the Kappa. As he didn't take quirks, he takes video game superpowers, he hurts no one, maybe his thumbs a little, his nerves, playing games in their hardest setting can be a test of patience. But the lingering fear of becoming the Kappa was there. It was there the moment he acquired Blade Mode, even before his mother mentioned it. The old saying kept popping on his mind every time he used his powers. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and he felt the fear that it might do that to him. But it had been a struggle, either by chance or choice he ends up adding something else, the Thursday um, by chance, blade mode, by choice, siren powers, by accident, the light, by choice and fear. He didn't like how things were now, Sir Naitai's visit had served to made him realize that Aldera, and by extension, anyone associated with them, would be targeting him and his family. It was paranoia built out of facts that he could see. The case was already with TV coverage. The internet, at least locally, could not stop talking about the Aldera case as it was referred to. There were two clear sides, the ones that wanted the school finally brought to Neil an answer for all it had done, the other who wanted it to succeed, despite its history, and the blood it has shed. Freaking social warriors, reacting to anything and believing they are right, without knowing the full story, typical of them, pretty much corrupted the term social justice warrior beyond repair. Sai LAS. Izuku shouted, letting the power of the shout wash over him and allow him sight of auras around him, more precisely, people. Again, he grew paranoid, using the aura whisper shout periodically to check his surroundings. Seeing no one, as usual, only the auras of his neighbors, Izuka closed his eyes, letting the power wash away, aura whisper would not cancel on command, it was something that all shouts had, a weakness in the very time they work, he can stack them up, ensure that they continue on a target, but he had to be careful. Don't want to end up killing someone because he thought using drain vitality and staking it up was a good idea. Looking at his hand, he saw he had made a circle, or what could pass as one, it looked more like something drawn by a one-year-old baby, it was connected from end to end, and crackled with arc energy, but he needed to train more, perfect his control. Maybe he was doing two advanced exercises. Using just one hand, he brought both hands close enough and let arc energy dance one another. This time he was able to form a passable circle out of arc energy. As he watched this, he resolved to train as hard as he could. The light was by far the most powerful and destructive power he had now. The arc energy in his hands can disintegrate someone, not electrocute, disintegrate. If he wanted to help people he had to tame his powers, lest he hurts someone with them. He was still on the fence of adding more powers, mostly because of his fear of becoming the Kappa. Thanks to the burning of his only controller, he pretty much couldn't do anything to gain more. He had the money, but not the means to get one. He could order online. But then there was his mom. She just knew stuff, so better not push it. Besides, he was advanced enough in several games that he could catch up with them in the time he recovers from his fracture and can actually walk and go to a store and buy another. He could float, but that might count as illegal usage of a quirk without license, 
and he really doesn't want to explain that what he is using is in fact a par casual force that he got from a video game. There is quirk crazy, and there is downright ridiculous. The day it happened, morning. The rain pitted the roofs of many houses in Yuzurufu. The bad weather hasn't exactly abetted in the past days. It hasn't gotten worse either, just a steady amount of rain that fell on the city. Many blamed it on a quirk, which considering the days they live in, might not be that far off the truth. Izuka wanted to use clear skies shout to stop the rain, if at least for some hours the cold was making his leg hurt like hell, it is killing him. He couldn't, as his mom had pretty much said no. No you're not going to shout at the sky like a lunatic to see if you can actually disperse the rain, you might mess the weather pattern had been her argument. His counter had been that the weather was messed up as it was, one shout would not made the difference. At least if it worked he could add weather changer to his list of what can I do with my powers list. Mom? Izuka asked from his position on the sofa, seated, hands cupped together and harnessing arc light, trying to form the shape of a cube. Yes, dear? His mother asked from the kitchen, finishing what would be their lunch, and packing her own food for the day of work. Are you going to auntie's dinner? Izuka asked, having forgotten about that. Considering all that happened, he wasn't exactly to blame for that. Izuku Inko began. It happened three days ago. I had to cancel. I return of work too tired, and you are in no condition to leave the house, his mother reminded. Mom, I am not dying. I broke a leg, Izuka said. Also, what are you doing at your job? I just thought you crunched numbers. Izuka wondered. The arc energy shaped like a cube now took the shape of a pyramid. Is more than crunching numbers, I have to sort out payments and deduce the overall budget the agency has and keep them in neat piles, especially with collateral damage, Inko reminded. This week has been held to be honest, several agencies have been targeted by the Hero Public Safety Commission, there had been some credible claims of embezzles. Two agencies are already on the loop for it, Inko stated. Really? But the one you work in is brand new, barely a month. If I recall it was founded by Magma Dragoon and Frost. Why is targeted? Izuka asked, referring to his mother bosses. Two rookie pro heroes who were not afraid to ask for help and professional help when needed. The burning judo hero, Magma Dragoon and the cold heroine, Frost. The representative of the HPSC said half of the agency selected was on a ballot. The others were selected because they were suspicious of embezzles. We just happened to be on the first... Dragoon wants me to have a sheet of our finances so we can have the HPSC out of our hair. The investigation has lagged the work of the agency to a crawl, Inko stated with a frown. Not to mention Frost. I think this investigation has her on edge. She froze her coffee when we learned what was going on, and nearly froze a copy machine because it was not working, Inko added as she shook her head. The city is chock full of delinquents and underage villains. And I just learned some heroes were doing some embezzles. Wonderful. She hissed. Mom, they are humans tied to human flaws like greed. Izuka reminded. The arc pyramid in his hands became an octahedron. I am not defending them. Just that we kind of forget they are humans flawed. He added. Looking at his hands, Inko peeked her head from the kitchen. Looking at Izuku and the energy shaped thing on his hands. Yes, for how long are you going to keep that up? Inko asked, changing the subject, Izuku immediately perked up. Until I can do it without thinking and looking then I'm moving to one hand, Izuku said. I need control, the light is powerful, but rather volatile, the average guardian can effectively disintegrate someone with their light. A hero does not disintegrate, unless it's rubble then that's fair game, or a BOW, Izuku said. I have all the time on the world to perfect my control over the light, two months. After that well, train the body, my legs already feel weak without all the walking. Izuka said, making Inko smile, she was glad he wasn't taking anything for granted. Good, Inko stated with a smile. Have you talked with your friend, what was her name, Michaela? Izuka nodded, albeit with a sad smile. Yes, she is doing well in semi, apparently the school is not too keen with racism and bullies, they have the highest expulsion rate of any school in Japan regarding that. Some say that the school is too soft, 
and the kids should learn to stand up on their own, but when the kids have the potential of becoming walking nukes, well they can't put the excuse of we are tough so they can be tough because it can end bad for someone. Izuku whispered, making Inko roll her eyes. Two hundred years ago, the kids having to endure bullying and do nothing may have been the norm, not only in Japan, but the world, but after an incident in Florida, the blindfold was off. The ear muffins were roughly yanked, and those who tried to justify bullying creates character had to face a horrible truth once quirks were introduced to the world. The reality that others tried to ignore was shoved to their faces and schools around the world had to adapt to this new environment. Europe was a leader in these kind of actions, America, as in South, Center and North America had to follow. Especially North America after the NRA fell due to quirks replacing them and allowing several reforms to be finally placed, that and three quirk-related attacks in schools. Japan, sadly had not moved too well, technologically wise they were leaders socially things were not that well, gaijins were still a demeaning term, even after 200 years, Japan as a society was still hyper-competitive, failure could lead to tragedy if you weren't careful, last but not least, bullying, you had to endure it. It creates character, it is still endorsed in many schools, many parents still believe that bullying does build character. She is no kind of mother to wrap her son in bubble wrap, she knows the world can be cruel, and she had taught him how to roll with the punches the best way possible, but sometimes the world is just pushing it, and sometimes she just wishes she could punch the world back, and stomp its head, and kick it in the balls, and stomp the balls, and fingers, and cave its teeth in. Oh, I'm glad, I was afraid she might, you know, Inko began. Get, a complex or something. An assault is not something you can walk out and scathe, she added. I know, I still have, dreams, Michaela does too, Izuka said with a frown. One Inko mimicked, she knew that his dreams were more akin to nightmares, waking up at the middle of the night, mid-shout and making the apartment shake by the force of his voice alone, eyes darting around and sweating. Ready to fight whatever monster that lurks his nightmares, monsters she knew had names, and were unlike the monsters from video games, very real, and far worse than a mutant using a rocket launcher as a club. One could not really be prepared for the evils of men. Oh dear, Inko crooned. I know I can't relate, but I know that. As long she has you as her friend, she will be fine. Besides, she is a strong girl, she'll overcome it. Inko said with a small smile. I know she will, but the question is how much time will pass before she can. Izuka wondered. The mind is a fragile thing. You can't heal the mind like healing a wound. It doesn't take days, nor months, but years. I worry for her. I do too, dear, but we have to dash. Tap. Izuka actually perked up. So did Inko. Something had tapped a window. Mom, did you hurt a tap? Izuka asked. Inko again poked her head out of the kitchen. I did, dear. Sounded too hard to be a bird. Both Midoriya's actually winced when something began to scrape one of the windows, like someone dragging a knife on the glass. Mom, that came of your room. Izuku actually stood up on his good leg, then began to float using arc light, his hands dancing with the same energy. Elias! Izuku intoned, and his eyes widened when he saw the aura of what was making the noise. Or rather the number of auras currently outside, hanging from the wall. Turning around Izuku was ready to call his mother to leave when Aura Whisper revealed what lay on the entrance of their home. M.O.M. Hide! Boom! Inko had little time to see what had just knocked the door of their home, only that it was big, clad in black and moving at a speed not befitting its colossal form. But Izuku recognized what had just charged their home entrance, and in panic rose his arms, and without hesitation let loose a bolt of pure arc light the bolt traveling at a speed befitting lighting and hitting like a truck. Boom! The nemesis was instantly toppled by the sheer impact and electrical discharge, but momentum kept it forward. Izuka moved at the side, avoiding the seven and some foot tall monster. Crash! Only for glass to rain on him, some met his face, but barely phased him. What did phase him were the two golems that actually rappelled into the living room. 
Damn it, I didn't solve them with or a whisper. Izuka thought angrily. The two golems landed hard on the floor, one of them flinging the sofa to a side like if it was no. Pain. Izuka was now flying, his back hurt, then his face hurt when he landed on it. Rotating to his side he was the reason why. Another nemesis, there were two nemesis, two golems and whatever were outside. Leave my son alone! Izuka's eyes widened when he saw his mother charge at the nemesis that hit him in the back, knife in hand, and jamming it up to the hilt in the nemesis' throat, purple like blood pouring out of the wound. Then the thing backhanded his mom, and Izuka saw red. You! Six ethereal arms sprung forth and slammed into the ground, propelling him upwards, towards the wounded nemesis. As you grow Dien, the room shook with his voice, and his fist, all eight of them were encased with a wisp of air, air that was mixed with arc light. The first fist met the knife, pushing it even deeper, the hilt disappeared in the throat of the creature that staggered after the vicious blow, and arc energy caused it to suffer more pain. Izuka didn't know how to throw a punch, but that didn't matter much when your life is on the line, you have enhanced strength. Speedier hits and the target in front of you towers over you. So he aimed his real fist to the midsection, a vicious but sloppy hook that anyone could block if they didn't had a knife jammed up their throats. Crack. The satisfying sound of bones breaking made Izuka snarl as he brought another punishing blow to the midsection. Again another crack signified a cracked bone and the creature staggered, and Izuka capitalized it. His siren arms began to rain punch after punch on the damaged midsection, each blow making the sound of broken bones fill the air. Ten blows made the creature fall to a wall in pain, blood pouring from the knife wound. A growl behind him made him remember the golems and the other nemesis. The golems, just like their game counterparts, were slow, and were armed with the same sword-like energy pike on their right arm, looked like an anorexic gorilla with a military hazmat suit, and Izuku was done analyzing at this point. Eyes he slen and yes! A concentrated blast of cold hit the two golems before they could move, and they were instantly encased in ice. They still tried to move, but the ice was thick enough to keep them from moving. With that out of the way he focused on the first nemesis, still on the ground and trying to stand. Bam! Izuka gave it no such reprieve, he brought his arms upward, encased in arc light, and brought them down like a hammer. Instantly the nemesis cried in pain as it was roughly shoved to the ground by a force superior to its own. There Izuka brought his siren arms to bear, and began to punish the nemesis back. Crack. 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 Izuka punished the beast for attacking his home by breaking its back, and ribs, and probably exploding its internal organs by the brutal blows that made the nemesis vomit purple blood. Crash. Crack. Izuka looked to the source of the noise, and his eyes widened, liquors, at least five of them. Five dead liquors in his opinion. F.O. Crack dying. With a scream, Izuka let loose ice breath at the all, and sustained it, making the five liquors rushing at them actually recoil in pain and slow their movements as frost began to encase their exposed muscles. Two that were on the ceiling fell to the ground with a thud and along the other three began to trash around, trying to shake the frost forming on them, but their movements began to lag due to the intense cold. Closing his mouth Izuka focused his attention on the golems that were still frozen, but struggling, he began to float to them, angry, arc light enveloping his hands. With a snarl he thrusted both his palms at the creatures, letting out a torrent of energy that hit them straight and pushed them into a wall. Broke the ice and made them twitch in agony, only to be disintegrated by the sudden influx of energy, letting an imprint of their bodies on the wall. Pow! Izuku again cursed not paying attention as he face throbbed with pain. Stumbling he noted that the nemesis with the broken ribs had punched him with its brass knuckles encased hand, but he also noted that it had several stabs on its arms and he risked a glance to his mom, and while the nemesis lumbered painfully to him, he saw her clutching her stomach, a bloody knife on her hands, purple blood, nemesis blood. Izuku snarled, the world rushed around him as he somehow zoomed into the nemesis, fist cocked back, then he struck. 
The nemesis let out a yowl of pain as a fist simply tore fabric, muscle, and cybernetics. Izuka let out a roar as he let out arc energy into his hand, and began to electrocute the nemesis from within. But it wasn't enough, he wanted to take this thing down now. He channeled all he could in his hand, not realizing he was covering himself as well in arc light. It began to feel painful to hold so much energy in his hand, and when he felt he could hold no more, he let it all loose with a yell. Inko, who was on the ground, after procuring another knife to stab the thing that had dared to attack her son, had a first seat view of disembowelment and bisection by arc light. A torrent of pure, blue energy came out of the creature's back, making it scream in agony. Her son seemed to be the source of the thing's agony. As she saw him move his hand, so did the concentrated beam of energy that simply ate the mass of the creature and sawed it in two, only a tiny amount of flesh holding waist to torso together as it fell, peering organs, blood and mechanical parts to the ground, dead. Izuka had targets once he saw he had used chaos reach at point blank and fire it without hesitation. Twisting his hand, he aimed it at the struggling liquors. The beams simply grazed them by. But grazed by a pure source of energy is the same as being cut in two by a sword. It rendered flesh away and in the case of the liquors who simply had one single second of exposure, burned their muscles and flesh fused their cybernetics painfully. Izuka kept the beam up, basically gouging a trench on his home walls, and aimed it at the second nemesis. With a scream he began to saw the creature in two, the nemesis, weakened and crippled, was unable to fight back, and the beam sliced it in two, vaporizing blood and organs and so the floor. Izuka killed off the chaos reach, activating his siren arms, and focused his attention on the wounded, but alive liquors, all struggling to get up and fight, but when half of their everything was either on fire, flash vaporized or frozen, they looked more like trying to beg for mercy than fight back. Izuku spared them no mercy, in front of the first liquor, he had his six arms rise up, then he brought them down on the liquor's head. Crack! The sound of bone and flesh giving into a superior force made the other liquors try to reach the source of the noise. Izuka had none of that, and repeated it with the other four. Crack. 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 Then there was silence on the apartment. Only the deep breaths of Izuku and Inko, and the sound of flesh still sizzling after such an exposure. Pant, mom, pant, are you okay? Izuka asked rubbing his face where the nemesis had hit him. Yes, Inko replied, she had to tame her instincts, which were telling her go hug the hell out of her son, and instead went for the phone, or her cell phone whichever was closer, and called the police. They were just attacked, and needed professional help, medical too. With a small smile, Izuka began to approach his mom, but before he could even reach her, he saw her actually recoil, several times, reaching for her back and then exposing to Izuka several darts on her back, filled with what seemed to be red liquid in them. No, Effie Dash. He never was able to finish even the first word of power before several darts met his neck and arms, and his vision became blurry, muscles simply giving out as he tried to stand up and reach his mother, who was now on the ground, unconscious. Izuka followed her not soon after. Jesus Christ, he fucked them all up. His mother picked up a fight with a nemesis, with a knife, and this surprises you? Enough, pick them up now. Okay, both boys were afraid of Izuku, they knew him from school, but never in a million years they would think they would be afraid of the once quirkless kid. But they were far more afraid of B and any retaliation she might think of. Stowing the air guns and moving inside the home, each one picked a Midoriya up, they had minor strength enhancement quirks at least with the strength of three men each, so they had no problems of hoisting the two up and moving away. Queen Bee on her part, looked at the destruction on the living room, two dead nemesis, two disintegrated pawn golems, and five butchered liquors, it could have been worse, but the idea had been to wear Izuka down, to beat him and his mom, bleed them a little, then knock them down and move them away. Not this. With a sneer be moved away, there was no time for clean-up, she could faintly hear the neighbors actually making calls to the cops. They didn't know what had happened, 
only called the cops due to noise and honestly there was no way to clean up what Izuku had done. So they left with their cargo, no one the wiser. A van was waiting for them in the parking lot. The two Midoriyas were tossed roughly into it, and once they were inside, they were gone, none the wiser. No one would be looking for them, no one would be hearing from them, only their obituaries. How wrong she was. Two hours later. Sir Knight I surveyed the scene before them. It had been a fast deployment, fast in the relative term. The first responders, a pair of patrollers that had been called due to civil disturbance had found the scene before them and had called for specialized reinforcements, heroic reinforcements. The fact Bubble Girl had been among those called to be reinforcements was just a casualty, in all honesty. But luck does play a factor in heroics. Just as Bubble Girl had told him, two tyrant types, nemesis, bisected by the waist by what seemed to be a powerful current, one had a knife still jammed up its throat and multiple lacerations in its arm, the other had a broken spine and ribs by what they could see, which was a lot considering its organs were on a puddle where it lay dead. Two pawn class golems, part of the troop frontal troops, up until a week ago they had no name until Izuka gave them one, what was left of them just a grease mark of their forms in a wall, and one of their laser-like pikes. And of course, five dead liquors, their skulls simply crushed to a mush, although Bubble Girl failed to mention the fact they looked like if they had been hit by a glancing blow of whatever it was used to cut the nemesis in two, oh, and the fact the hall where they died felt cold, unnaturally cold. A massive gouge of what he assumed was the energy that cut the nemesis down, dotted the walls of the living room, the remains of a sofa tossed aside, a bloody knife caked with the blood of a nemesis, two strange darts, one near the kitchen the other where the nemesis types lay dead was all the evidence they had now, but that would change soon. Whoa, Midoriya surely put them through their paces, Mirio commented on his side. Yes, it is as said, beware the quiet ones, Night I commented, seeing Bubble Girl pass the cold hall that connected the rooms to the living room. Those liquors entered through one of the room's windows. I presume the nemesis broke through the main door and the golems rappelled in. This was a planned hit, she commented. Indeed, a Pyrrhic victory, they got their targets, but the loss of assets, especially something so sophisticated as the golems and the nemesis is not to be taken lightly, Night I stated. Inko Midoriya's cell phone is still present, and security cameras in the building and the streets do confirm our theory, kidnapping. Night, I added, turning to one of the cops on the scene. Do we have a positive ID of the suspects? Partly, we identified the girl, Yuki Takanawa, alias Queen B. The cops stated, making Night Eye frown, of course. The others are partial, we don't know their identities, but we can assume they work for her, maybe part of her gang. The cop added, their Sir Night Eye looked at Mirio, who nodded, they already had a plan in motion. They just needed the okay of the chief of police. Do the cameras were able to follow the van, it is identified properly? He asked once more. Completely, but we have an issue, several of our cameras were compromised. The cop stated, making Naitai and Mirio glance at one another. Compromised? Naitai wondered. Yes, at certain points they began to emit static, making it difficult for identification, some outright died on us but we were able to use several cameras, including those of shops for the location of the van. The cop didn't elaborate it much, and Naitai was thankful. For this officer was among the many selected for the raid that they would carry, hopefully, tonight. Good, I am aware that we have elements posed in the area? The cop nodded. They reported on this? Yes, they were told not to intervene, lest we tip them off. They were very vocal about this but are waiting for the go. Night I nodded. Lemillion, prepare yourself. Go to the exfil point and wait for the signal. The boy nodded, looking at the destroyed apartment one more time, then left as fast as he could. As for Night Eye itself, he just looked at the area, accessing the destruction. There was honestly not much info regarding Izuka's quirk potential. Only what Lemillion had told him and what Midoriya itself had told him. There was no catalogued evidence until now. Ah, uh, sir. The voice of Mirio actually made him look back, seeing his protege back in the apartment, looking rather sheepishly. 
We got a situation. He stated with a frown, something you don't see often on Mario. A situatio. Naitai realized what Mario meant. This was not just a statement, but a code phrase. We got a situation was code for Durara Honda. As if summoning him, the man entered the apartment, like if he owned it. Durara Honda was rather short, compared to most people, he was of the height of Inko Midoriya, and rather stout, black hair that was brushed to a side, like an emo haircut and hairstyle, clad in a detective's coat, looked not his age, as stress lines had formed on his face, considering he was actually twenty-eight. Also he was quirkless, which would explain why he glared with his brown eyes at everyone, that and he was an entitled twat, perks of being the mayor's son. Why there is a stakeout and I'm not on the case? He asked, rather loudly. Because you're a bitch. One of the cops, a female stated with a smirk as she took another picture, for evidence, of what was left of the liquors. Because you are as appealing as slapping my dick on a cactus. Another cop added, placing one of the darts in a plastic bag and sealing it, for evidence. Because you ruin everything, you're inexperienced and everyone in the room including the dead want to kill you. Another cop stated, grabbing the pike stunner of the golem with gloved hands and started to move away. Durara, for his part, actually sneered at the cops. You fuckers are one word from losing your jobs when my father dash. Your father, night I made himself know, looking at Mirio and motioning him to leave the apartment to get ready. Has no power their jobs, unlike his, are not tied to the whims of the people. Night I stated with a glare. What are you doing here, Honda? This is a delicate operation, Naitai reminded. Durara actually sneered. What I see it's a massive fuck-up, several corpses of upstanding citizens and a failure to capture the perpetrator, he stated with a sneer. Upstanding? Naitai was already angry, but he kept it well hidden. Now this twat was actually suggesting these things were human. What you failed to see, Officer Honda? Night I sneered. Is that this is a crime scene, a kidnapping, these? He motioned to the bagged corpse of a nemesis, being lifted to a metal stretcher by two cops and moving both halves away. Are part of the kidnapper's attempt, bioorganic weapons of the highest caliber, we have two citizens missing. The scene itself show us the desperation of the kidnapped ones. He added with a growl, then leaned forward to Honda. And I swear to God that if you fuck this up for us, I will personally break your back. Death, it's too good for you. Durara simple scoffed at Naitai's threat. Bitch, you're a hero, a nobody. You touch me, I kill you, and nobody is going to miss you. As for this moment, I take control of this case and everything in it, including your gay ass. Durara actually pushed Naitai. Not that he moved him way too much. Sir Naitai was ripped under those clothes. Okay, pack it up. We got a murder on our case, not a kidnapping. So start picking up evidence, look up the computers and cell phones, I want the face of that kid murderer on the TV by this hour's end. All the cops looked at Honda, rolled their eyes and continued their gathering of evidence, completely ignoring him, this angered him. Motherfuckers I gave you an order, move it! Again no one did as told, they continued their work as usual. Your asses are on the line, fucking start doing as told. One of the cops simply sighed as he closed the bag on one of the corpses of the liquors. Fine, the hard way it is. Honda snarled as he stalked away, kicking the corpse of the nemesis with the knife on its throat, actually stomping its head. Oops, pss. he fake apologized as he left the apartment, after contaminated a piece of evidence. Sir Knight, I took a deep breath. He had been told that working around Durara Honda was a test of patience. He clearly had underestimated what he had been told. It was not a test, it was a gauntlet, and he had nearly failed. Only years of mental fortitude and patience in working with cases that contest you saved Durara Honda from having to pick his teeth from the floor. Still, Bubble Girl, the blue-skinned, blue-haired heroine looked at her boss. Follow him, keep me appraised, if he endangers the job, disable him, he stated with a frosty tone of voice. Bubble Girl nodded without saying a word and walked away, following Durara, all while Sir Naitai looked at the gathering of evidence. There was still much to do. With a frown he pulled his cell phone, feeling it vibrate, 
Looking it up, he saw two messages, one from Yagi, the other from the chief of police itself. Clicking the first text from Yagi, he saw something that made him dread a little. It said midnight, today, be there night I actually took a deep breath. This was bad, really bad. He opened the other text and saw something that made him smile. Approved. Everyone, gather everything, we have the green light, at 11 we move. Ari was afraid, really afraid, she hadn't seen the one that had took her that moment. Only that she had seen darkness and then nothing else, waking up in a cell. It wasn't a cell back in the compound, or the other cell where they had took her, but it was a cell. She got food, it wasn't anything special, mashed something, she ate it, for she was hungry and there was a blanket she could use to ward off the cold of the cell. There was also the lights, or light better said, some sort of red light that was not comfortable. It made her horn ache and the scars in her arms and legs to slightly burn, cold. Then the men, or boys returned, dragging to other people. They were related, their hair was the same, but the woman was rounder. The boy had something on his right leg. She realized what it was when they tossed them inside her cell. A cast, his leg was broken. Neither of them were conscious, but by the looks, they were being affected by the light in the same way as she was now. Their faces, scrunched in slight discomfort, told her everything. Then the boy woke up, his skin letting out a stream of electricity, and sat up, looking around in panic, spotting her, and honestly scaring her. The boy was looking around, then he spotted the woman, and immediately dragged himself to her side, yelling. M.O.M. And making the room vibrate slightly, Ari felt her everything vibrate with the power behind that shout, but she felt it should have been louder. He began to shake the woman, but she seemed unresponsive. She won't wake. Ari decided to chime in, making the boy look at her. She was struck by his eyes, so green and deep, his hair was so messy too. They inject you with something, and you won't wake until it runs its course. She supplied, being far more aware of what was done here than anyone else. It had been done to her too many times to count. The boy actually regarded her, then looked around, seeing the cell. Honestly, it looked more like a room, but she knew better than anyone else that cells don't need bars to be one. WH, where are we? He asked, looking dazed. Last thing I remember our home, the nemesis. He muttered by some reason beyond her. His voice carried strength that no whisper should have. I don't know, Ari replied, looking around. I escaped somewhere else before, then I got taken by someone else again. The moment she said that and blinked, the boy was in front of her, looking at her with something she failed to recognize immediately. Concern. Are you okay? Were you hurt? He asked, actually taking one of her hands and looking it over. She felt warm, actually warm. She shook her head. No, but they took me of the bird people, Kai. But they did the same things Kai did to me. They touched me somewhere. Eri actually blinked when her hair seemed to frazzle with life. Then she realized that lighting was dancing on her skin and that the boy was the source and O-H-M-Y-G-O-D-W-H-Y-C-H-I-S-A-N-G-R-Y. The boy seemed to realize this as he calmed down. The lighting ceased in both of them. I'm sorry, he apologized. It just, things like that, makes me angry. Eri blinked. Did his voice got deeper? Ah, uh, my name's Izuku. Now the boy had a name she could refer to, my mom. He turned, looking at the still down woman. Her name's Inko, what's yours? Izuku asked her. Eri on her part blinked. In the span of two minutes, this boy had gotten angry at her situation? Did he worry about her health? Was he for real? He wasn't a figment of her imagination? Airy, she said, he did something with his lips. They curved upwards. What kind of sorcery was that? Airy, what a pretty name, Izuku stated as he patted her head and ruffled slightly her hair. Airy blinked once, twice, thrice, then something broke in her. Izuku had a small panic attack when she lunged at him and then he panicked for Ryo when she began to cry on his chest. Enji Todoroki walked on autopilot. It was something that he had been doing for the past five years of his life. 
The room remained the same, the same bed, the same machine, the same decorations, the same occupant. Enji bit the cold pit that always formed on his stomach whenever he entered the room. With a big sigh, he did so, a bouquet of flowers in his hands. He nodded at the nurse in the room. The nurse nodded back with a small smile as she left the room. Once she was gone, Enji turned his attention to a vase full of flowers. It was big, big enough for him to put the bouquet in, which he did with great care. He noted that there were more, fresher flowers than the last time he was here, which was a week ago. Honestly, if he could, he would be here every day. But hero work never ends, criminals never rest, and bills never cease to come, so he continued to work. Taking a seat, Enji took his big frame and sat at the side of the bed. Hello, Ray. Enji began, eyeing the form of Ray Todoroki, his wife, bound to a bed, a nasal cannula to supply her air. But Enji knew that the damage to her lungs was small and insignificant compared to what lay under the blankets and whatever now swam in her bloodstream and kept her unconscious. I'm sorry I'm late, but another villain, you know, it's no excuse, but honestly is the only thing that persists these days, villains attacks. Enji said, spotting Ray's hand, he slowly took it, savoring the feel of her cold hand on his. Once upon a time he thought that her soft skin was a sign of weakness, one that Toya inherited, but now? He wished he could feel her soft skin all day. I NG hesitated. After all that was done to her, after all he made her pass, he felt undeserving of being in the same room as her. Every time he came, he remembered the good and the bad of their relationship, and he was angry at himself for being the reason of most of the bad. The kids, they are okay, most of them. NG began his weekly ritual, the doctors and specialists said that one could hear, even in such a state, it helped the brain in keeping activity, and even the most optimistic, gave the unconscious some sort of strength to wake up. But Enji knew better. What kept Ray unconscious was not a wound to the head, but a chemical in her blood that had immediately bounded her to bed, a chemical an enemy of Enji had injected on her, even after wounding her the way they did. It angered him to no end, that he hasn't been able to find who did this to his wife, or that someone had found a cure to what ails her. Natsu is in college studying medicine, he might not admit it, and denies it, but I know he has a girlfriend, he's just afraid of what I'll say, as usual, my reputation precedes me, Enji began. For Yumi, I'll be honest, I know little what she does now, she distanced herself of the family after what happened to you, but you know this, I told you this every week, and I feel that I am to blame for this, for her distance, because she feels I did little to help you, to stop whoever did this to you. Enji summarized, rubbing a thumb over his wife's hand. Shodo, he is doing okay. I saw him practicing with his fire and ice at the same time. He doesn't show it, but he feels for you. And again, I am to blame for it, for the way he acts. That day, I pushed you over the edge, and I send you away, when I should have made sure not to hurt you and our son and God. Enji said with a whisper. I am a monster, you married me. Even after your family said no, you married me, and I took you for granted, he added with a frown. And then, this? Five years ago he received a call from the ward where Ray was being treated. The stress that he had caused her had finally broke her, despite being, him. He didn't simply send Ray away just because, what happened to her could have easily happened to him, or Fuyumi or Natsuo. He spared no expenses on the doctors and the facilities she would be staying until she was well. Then a fire broke out. Witnesses and survivors claimed the fire began as blue. It told Enji a lot about the user. It had a fire quirk of a great magnitude. But due to the fire burning hotter than anything he or other fire quirk user could feasibly do without hurting themselves, so said fire had to be used sparingly. Or so he believed. Witnesses claimed that a quarter of the ward was engulfed in those flames before they began to burn their average coloration, red. Of course they were trained to these kind of situations. It wasn't the first time a fire broke out in the ward. The problem was what happened during the evacuation. Someone was waiting the evacuees, or better said, something was waiting for them. It was Enji's first brush with what the Americans called terminators. In Japan they had another name. T-dolls, cyborgs, made from cloned human tissue, 
like skin and some organs, then augmented with cybernetics that honestly made the ones made in Ireland look archaic in comparison, also deadly, extremely so. Their first appearance had been in a base in El Paso, Texas. The soldiers that were not trained to deal with something that moved at the speed of ingenium and had bones of titanium, and whose skin was reinforced to sustain concentrated firepower, they still were able to destroy all three T dolls that attacked them, but after they pumped them with enough bullets. Grenades and a liberal use of quirks that were not meant to be used on combat, as they weren't suited for that. The good news was that even after their first appearance 20 years ago, the troop, who claimed them as their best units, had to be upgraded in any significant way. The basic doll had retractable blades mounted under their arms, while their upper arms had a small barrel that fired 9mm rounds on both arms. Their legs were a myriad of synthetic muscles that provided the strength of 20 dynamite sticks blowing up every time, so they kicked and moved fast due to their explosive reaction. Also on the back of their thighs they had actual thrusters, for stability. Their torsos were simply bulletproof, and had their source of their energy. A strange core that was too fragile, and was heavily protected, and so were their heads. Their eyes were actually highly advanced sensor arrays, capable of seeing in nearly every spectrum the human eye could not see. They were also highly hard to make. A single T-Doll, by rough estimate, can cost up to $20 billion to make. Their most basic, the clone tissue takes time as well. Even more the hardening of the skin with specialized chemicals, the cyber augmentation of the very few organs they had, their programming and their appearance, up and all. A tea doll can be made in roughly five years by a dedicated team of 15 people and a complete assembly line, which explains their personality. They could range from cutesy and determined, to stoic and downright sadistic. Their AI matrixes were complex, so complex that Ireland has yet to acquire one. As the troop guarded them jealously, no T-Doll has ever been recovered after a fight, not even All Might, although he did had a reason. He punched one so hard it blew up. And that night he crossed one, or better said his wife crossed one, fought it too. T-Dolls don't handle the cold well enough, something in the chemical their skin are coated doesn't allow them to buffer the cold as well as natural human skin. But this one, this one was different, it was smarter than the average and blindsided his wife when he had arrived to a parking lot that looked more like a glacier. There he saw the doll stab his wife in the stomach, then inject her with something at the same spot. That day he saw the face of the doll, pale blue eyes, tan skin and red hair, small too, almost comical, like a lowly. But that thing was anything but, the way it smiled at him, it made his blood boil that night, still does whenever he remembers, he had clipped it too, in rage he had grabbed its arm and boiled it of its socket, the fucking thing had escaped, uncaring of the damage done. That thing was responsible for his wife being on bed, with a strange toxin trying to ravage her system, to kill her. The doctors here were the best, and had treated her at the best of their abilities, they had stopped the toxin from harming her, but it was still there, reason why she hasn't woken up, until it is gone she won't wake up. Sad thing. She wasn't the only case in the world. She was the only one to survive it. The ways the others died were classified. Not even he could get them to tell him what would have happened if his wife died thanks to the toxin. Something horrible. So horrible that the doctors paled whenever mentioned. Shaking those thoughts, Ng focused again on his wife. Leaning in he kissed her hand clasped on his own. It was the most he could do. He didn't feel worthy of doing anything else. Until she awakens. He will do everything in his power to seek her forgiveness, try to start over. If she wants the divorce after what happened, it would kill him. But he would give it to her. BZZZT. BZZZT. NG bit a growl as he pulled out his cell phone. He had half a mind to incinerate it. His sidekicks knew that he was not to be bothered when he came to the hospital. They might not know who he visited but the fact he told them quite clearly made them realize that it was not something worth getting burned for. Feeling the insentient buzz in his hands, and seeing that the idea of it was of the detective friend of All Might NG decided to answer, maybe it was to hash out the final details on this raid against the troop training ground. With a press of the screen, NG brought the cell phone to his ear, speak, he stated, and so the detective spoke, 
and Enji's eyes widened. Today? They did what? Enji was not a man easily surprised, but what the troop did, oh this was the icing on the cake. Very well, I'll call my sidekicks, coordinate with Naitai, we'll be there. And with that he ended the call, looking at the sleeping for Avray, with a small kiss, again on her hand, Enji departed the room. Once outside, he motioned both guards posted to it, and the nurse in waiting, and nodded. Today, Enji Todoroki would earn himself some petty vengeance against the troop for what they did to his wife, and he was going to enjoy every second of it. Inko bit a groan as she slowly regained her senses, her muscles hurt, and by some reason her hands were aching, like if she had overused her quirk. No, like if the muscles that were overused, not her quirk. Opening her eyes, the first thing Inko saw was red, more like red illumination. The floor was black and cold. Groaning, she brought her hands to the floor so she could stand up, biting a curse as her hands made contact with the ground and increased the ache in them. Mom! The voice of her son made her look up and distracted her from the pain. She also saw a little girl, white hair and red eyes, with a small horn on the right side of her head, looking at her strangely. Her son was soon within reach, actually limping his way towards her and helping her stand up. Izuku, what happened? She asked. She saw her son actually scoff in some anger. We got kidnapped, and I got a pretty good idea who was behind this. Izuku muttered with some anger. Inko noted that the tattoos visible in his hand and face weren't glowing with the same intensity as before, even more. Her son looked, pained, no, exhausted. Mom, the light on top of us, Izuka said as he guided her where the little girl was, seated on a blanket and looking at her oddly. It does something to quirks, I feel exhausted, but I can use the light of the traveler, if sparingly, my shouts, they feel weak. I can't use blade mode and my siren arms are on a fritz. Izuka commented as he sat in the blanket. After a second, Inko did the same. For a moment Inko looked at the single source of light in the room, attached to the ceiling, emitting a red light that made her eyes ache due to looking at it directly. My hands, Inko commented, risking it she rose them to Izuku and used her quirk to tug at his shirt. Only to nothing to happen, eyes wide she looked at her hands then at her son. I think it acts just like Eraserhead's quirk, it cancels a quirk activation when he looks at you with his active, Izuku said. Then, the little girl began, drawing attention to her. Why yours work? She wondered, something Inko wondered herself. There Izuka chuckled. I guess this really doesn't stack up to a park casual force like the light. It limits me greatly. I can't use solar or void light as well. I guess since I practiced a lot with arc light I can use it well enough to overpower this. But barely. Izuka muttered, making Inko frown. I could try to destroy the light projector. But I don't know if my powers will come back immediately, or slowly. He wondered. We can't take risks, but we can't stay here either, but you're right. Inko stated, looking at the girl, and flashing her a small smile. The girl looked at her oddly, before trying to do the same. Instead she looked like she couldn't smile at all. Uh, what are you doing, dear? Inko asked Eri. Izuka noted this, and actually wondered what Eri was doing to her face. Ah, uh, Eri looked around, then at Inko. What you were doing, with your face? She said. Inko had a second to process that, then blinked. What? Smile? Eri nodded. You were trying to smile? Eri nodded again, a frown on her face. But can't do it, I don't know how. That sentence made Inko and Izuka take blank looks on their faces. Their minds, however. Whoever hurt her must die was their shared thought, one they had to push aside as Izuka began to truly look around, eyes darting around the cell. Calling it a cell was not appropriate, there were black walls around them, strangely polished, so was the floor. The single source of light belonged to the red lamp encrusted to the ceiling in the middle of the room. There was no visible door, but there were small gaps on the ceiling, which he assumed where the air was pumped into the room. I see no door. But they somehow got us in somehow, Izuka muttered. There is no door, Eri began. One of the walls just moved and they put you two here, 
she said, stiffening when Inko began to stroke her head, softly, oh so softly. Eri leaned into the touch, it felt, good. They must have someone with an geomancy base quirk, or someone with the ability to manage this. Izuka said as he patted the ground they were sitting on. He or she may be responsible for creating this very room with their quirk, and us can make doors out of it when he or she wants, like Cementas. Izuka muttered, going full geek mode. But for that to happen they must have a steady supply of material, Izuka observed. This feels like obsidian, Inko muttered. Very polished I might add, it is perfectly polished, no blemishes either when one can cut oneself with sharp edges, she added. Mom, look around you, this amount of obsidian, either they do have a quirk user that can make it, or they actually got it from somewhere, either way, I might have something that can help us, but, Izuka said, looking at the ceiling, or better said, the lamp, I need to destroy that lamp, I doubt that my shouts are at full powers. I need the at full power if I want to overpower whoever has control of this. Izuka said, Inko looked at her son in actual shock. You got a shout that can make a door? She asked. No, I got a shout that can make stones bend their will to me. Izuka there blinked at that phrase. I need to stop quoting Oryx and Krieg. Izuka said, taking a deep breath and holding both his hands together and began to gather arc light in his hands. To Eri, who was a mere observant, watching Izuka suddenly gathering electricity out of thin air, even if it looked if he was putting some effort into it, was something to behold, she could feel the power behind it, it was, humbling, somehow it felt that it could trump Overhaul's own quirk. Even if it looked like he was struggling to keep it arching around his hands. Izuka's attempt to gather arc light ended when they heard the grinding sound of stone against stone, looking at the source. The trio looked that a small squared gap had formed, and there be appeared, smugly looking at Izuku. You, Izuka hissed, utter contempt oozing out of his mouth. Should have rendered your soul out when I had the chance. Izuka hissed, making B's smug smile to take a sharper turn to a scowl. You presume that you could, she stated. Nevertheless here we are, again face to face, a worthy one and a useless one, and his useless mother. Izuka's growl made the room actually vibrate, and to be to shut her mouth for an instant. Hit a nerve, haven't I? I'm going to do you like Bane did Batman. Izuka snarled, only the hand of his mother on his shoulder reminded him that he wasn't alone, so he relented, for the moment. Why you kidnapped us? Izuka asked. Why? Because I have yet to right the wrong you made by simply existing. Be snapped. There are two kinds of people who are born into this world, those who are meant for greatness, and those who are meant for nothing, you are nothing, therefore you were born quirkless. Be snapped, making Izuka growl. I was born for greatness, and I embraced it. Yet you somehow became, quirked, special, even in a world where everyone can be special, you are an abomination. Be looked to someone outside the cell, the nodded, and I'm about to right that wrong. Then someone entered their view of vision, and Izuka's eyes widened. Principal Honda? Izuka asked in disbelief, looking at the man in shock. You, you would sell people so easily? Principal Honda nodded at that. You should have killed yourself, young one, would have saved us a lot of problems, he said as he slipped his right arm into the cell. But that's something easily fixable. Izuku had little time to react as the index finger of Principal Honda opened up like a flower, and shot something at him, something that hit him straight in the head. And immediately, pain. Izuku fell to the ground, clutching the sides of his head in pain. My quirk is called Phantasm. The name throws out its true purpose. I can shoot a special seed out of my index fingers, and cause whoever gets hit by it to get attacked by their deeper, darkest emotions, basically getting their minds flayed by them, unless I stop them. Which I won't. He said as Inko kneeled in front of her son, then glared at the man. When I get out of here I am going to slit your throat and pull your heart out of it. Inko snarled, making the man take several steps back in fear. He was unimpressed however. As if, she said, looking at Inko and Eri. In two hours we are going to ascend this entire room to the main coliseum upstairs, the main event, your three being torn apart, alive, at a horde of liquors. 
be stated with a smirk, Inko snarled even more. The best part? Your son will be brain dead as they feast on your combined entrails. That way I will fix one of the greatest mistakes this world had ever made you. With that said, the gap closed. Only Azuka's whimpers of pain filled the room now. Eri now felt fear again, and she wasn't sure what would happen now. And there you have it, my amazing viewers. Part 3 of our awe-inspiring adventure has come to a close, but fear not, because the best is yet to come. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, activate those notifications, and gear up for the next heart-pounding episode of What If Deku Has Video Game Powers? But before I go, I want to hear from you, my fellow gaming heroes. Share your favorite moments from this episode in the comments below, and let me know what kind of epic boss battles or power-ups you'd like to see in the future.